I have a delicious surprise. It's a very special cake. I want you kiddies to have the first piece. In the pantheon of Hollywood's great triple threat performers, you can count Debbie Reynolds. Acting. Stop it, both of you. Friday, we decided to have a big wedding, and in two days, my best friend Alice hates me. Singing. Tammy, Tammy, you love him so. And dancing. Is it fair to say that you're the ultimate trooper? I'm stubborn. I'm very stubborn, and I would never give up ever about anything. That can-do spirit came in handy when, at the age of 19, she was cast opposite Gene Kelly in Singing in the Rain. You're 20 years younger than Gene Kelly, and you'd had no dance training? No, no, I had no training of any kind. It took three months of intensive dance lessons, but when the cameras rolled, Reynolds kept in step with co-stars Kelly and Donald O'Connor. Good morning, good morning. It's great to stay up late. Good morning, good morning to you. So we dance 10 and 12 hours every day. There's no days off. Just to give viewers a sense, of how much work this was. You say your feet were bleeding. I mean, what else hurt? I think your heart hurt. Could you keep up? Were you going to fail? And, and Gene Kelly kind of scared me because he was the boss and he was brilliant and he was a wonderful teacher. He had to teach me and to, to be given a little kitty cat and expect it to be a lion. It didn't happen overnight, and, there, and I had to work, work, work without question. Reynolds emerged a bona fide movie star. Funny, since all Mary Frances Reynolds wanted to be was a gym teacher. But when she won the Miss Burbank beauty pageant in 1948, she got a free blouse just for entering, Reynolds was discovered by a Warner Brothers talent scout. They had a screen test, and there was a camera there, and they said, look in the camera, and I said, so, okay, and they said, now just talk, just ad lib. I said, why would I do that? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. This is all so silly, and uh, they said, well, you want to be a movie star, don't you? And I said, no, I don't know anything about it. I don't want to be a star. I don't want to be a movie star. I can't possibly be a movie star. So Jack Warner saw the test and he said, well, she's funny. Sure, let's put her under contract, $65 a week. I want to be loved by you alone. Mary Frances became Debbie and soon enough was palling around on the MGM lot with Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth was really a, a gal, you know, she was a dame. You know, and I didn't know what dames were. She called me a little Girl Scout. She was right about that. I didn't know about the worldly world. And she knew everything about the worldly world and shared it with me. She was funny. She was really a body broad. And uh, I loved being with her. We had a lot of fun together. Soon, Reynolds met the crooner, Eddie Fisher. Let's fall in love. Why shouldn't we fall in love? What did you see in Eddie Fisher when you met him? Well, he was so cute, just adorable. He had big brown eyes and he was a very talented young man. Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher take their marriage vows at a friend's home in Grossinger, New York. America's sweethearts married in 1955. The newlyweds even hammed it up for Edward R. Murrow on Person to Person. Your eyes are the eyes of a woman in love, and oh, how they give you away. How sweet, isn't it? That's funny, isn't it? Yeah. They had two children, actress and writer Carrie and younger brother Todd. All those early movies, man, Tammy and all that, shoot, that's just her. That's just, that really was that's as... That's just her as, I don't want to say naive, but as... But she is a innocent, you know, right. she's a true innocent, and she always has been, that's why she gets so horribly screwed over sometimes. Well, that's one way of describing what happened with her first marriage. She and Fisher were close to Elizabeth Taylor and husband Mike Todd, 
And when Todd died in a plane crash, Fisher rushed to comfort Taylor and never came back. You must get tired of talking about Eddie Fisher and Elizabeth Taylor. No, I don't get tired of it. I, mean, I, I just like to clear it up for everybody. Everybody still see, seems to be so upset over it. When it happened, it just seemed to be such an explosion of people upset for me. And I appreciated it. Say goodbye, everybody. Once Taylor met Richard Burton on the set of Cleopatra, she promptly dismissed Eddie Fisher. After Elizabeth Taylor left him, if he had wanted to, would you have taken him back? No. No, but I did laugh. <laughs> you la laughed when, right when that relationship well, broke up. Well, I laughed up. when Elizabeth threw him out because I told him, you know, it's just ridiculous. You can't break up a marriage for this affair you're having with Elizabeth because she's never going to keep you because you're not enough for her. You're just not enough. So he laughed, and of course he thought it was not true, but he found out when she threw him out that it was true. Reynolds didn't have as many marriages as Taylor, but they were no less dramatic. As the 80-year-old writes in her new book, her second and third husbands left her broke. Marriage and uh, movie stars don't seem to work out. The only ones that made it married a doctor, and they seemed to stay with them. Claudia Colbert, Irene Dunn, they married doctors. Could there be a doctor in your future? <laughs> there can't be any man in my future or woman. I mean, there will be none of that. I want to I'll be allowed to have my own life and my own problems. Ultimately, she dug herself out of the hole by auctioning off her vast Hollywood collection of costumes and memorabilia amassed over decades for tens of millions of dollars. But three husbands and two bankruptcies haven't hardened the heart of former Girl Scout Debbie Reynolds. You know, I'm not uh, a person that cries uh, a lot. The only reason that I, I get emotional is it's so wonderful that I can't believe I have this life. What does the people say? Oh, I cry at a good steak. Well, I don't cry at a good steak, but I sure do cry for all the lucky things I've had happen to me. Sorry? You are Tony Curtis. Yes, I am. Oh, I Tony you. Curtis is still drawing a crowd. Are you really Tony Curtis? No, is he here too? Is he here? <laughs> Where? As he walks through the lobby of the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas, his new hometown. Curtis, can I shake your hand, sir? Good evening, handsome boy. You. you can feel the charisma he first became aware of as a kid. I could see people respond when they saw me. They put smiles on their faces. I knew there was something. I won't say special about me, but something different that cut me out from all the other guys. Sugar, it's getting late. You better hurry back and change for dinner. And what other guy would dare, at age 77, take on his first musical theater role? A stage version of Some Like It Hot, the classic film comedy he co-starred in back in 1959. This time, instead of the cross-dressing saxophone man he played in the movie, Curtis is millionaire. I'm Osgood Fielding the third. The role immortalized by Joe E. Brown. If there's one thing I admire, it's a girl with a shapely ankle. Well, the character I'm playing is uh, everything I've ever wanted to be, and I am. <laughs> Which is what? Which is rich, famous, handsome, and a bit of a dog <laughs> who loves girls. <laughs> but Tony Curtis didn't always have it so good. He was born Bernard Schwartz in New York City, the son of poor Jewish immigrants. His dad, a tailor from Hungary, his mom from Czechoslovakia. You have talked about your mother being very tough on you as very a Very tough. She was tough. If there was anything awry or anything out of the way, she'd wipe the, she'd beat the shit out of me, you know? And I could see this maniacal look in her face when she did it. And after I got in the movie, she would always apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry, Tony, that I beat you when I was a kid. I said, it's okay, Mom, just forget it. So she felt very guilty about it, you know? At 17, he joined the Navy. When he finished his tour of duty, the GI Bill paid for acting school. The rest is Hollywood history.
An agent just happened to see you in one of those school productions? You saw me in a, a production of Golden Boy, which we did downtown at the Cherry Lane Theater. And the next thing I knew, somebody from Universal had seen it and called me to the office, and they gave me a plane ticket one way. But I didn't know anything. I mean, you know, I didn't know anything. You took elocution lessons, yes. too, to try to get that New York accent, yes. maybe a little yes. less of that? I swallowed a marble. Mrs. Fogler, speech coach at MGM, Universal had the chutzpah to send me to this woman because she was going to teach me how to speak properly. And she would give you marble, arranged in pain, formally and in pain. I swallowed one. <laughs> New York accent or not, the movie audience adored Tony Curtis. He moved quickly from bit parts to leads in swashbucklers like Alibaba. We can't break through, we'll make our stand in the great hall. He became a star. There was something that happened. Well, and yeah, I had all that dark hair and blue eyes, a nice figure jumping around, kissing girls, a lot of energy, hip hop and jump around. I mean, how could you not go for me? I even went for me. There were lots of hits, even if many were unmemorable, but he created some classic characters. Escape artist Harry Houdini. Stop it! Stop it! Stop that thing! He made it! The villain in trapeze with Burt Lancaster. I'm up to here with your words about a two act, the triple, and its purity. A noble slave in Spartacus with Kirk Douglas. I love you, Spartacus, as I love my own father. A hustling naval officer in Operation Petticoat with Cary Grant. You're not a volunteering type. What's your angle? The same as yours. Yeah, well, she sure helped those rocks. And in 1958, the Defiant Ones, in which Curtis and Sidney Poitier play a pair of escaped convicts. They both got Best Actor nominations. Sidney Poitier has said that you were responsible for the fact that he got star billing. Yes. At that point, no black man actor had ever been above the title in a movie. I said, you can't bill me above the title and put also starring uh, Sidney Poitier. You've got to put us, both of us above the title. That's where I want to be because we're chained together. And that's what happened. Sometimes Curtis had to fight his pretty boy image. Producer Dick Zanuck didn't see him as the Boston Strangler. So I went and had my nose fixed with some putty and combed my hair funny and had a Leica camera with a wide angle lens. I took pictures of me this way, this way, this way. Then I had it matted in eight by tens. And Zanuck said, I like it. Yeah, that's, that's the look of the man. Who is he? He said, Tony Curtis. Oh, and I got it. <laughs> Isn't that neat? But nothing was a bigger hit for Curtis than Some Like It Hot directed by the legendary Billy Wilder. Curtis and Jack Lemmon play two musicians on the Lamb from the Mob, who join up with an all-girl orchestra featuring Marilyn Monroe. How about the fittings? I mean, was it fun? So I went to Billy, he said, let Ori Kelly make you the dresses. He was making the big dresses for Marilyn and for the girls. So we said, great. I got so like Jack and I, we danced around him, or he's going to make a dress, da, 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 da. And he came by one day at Goldwyn Studios to our dressing rooms to take measurements. I was in my jockey shorts, 37, 44, 13, whatever it was. Then he went to Maryland. He started measuring her, and the guy's right, he said 13, 41. Then he got to a bottom and put the tape around, and he said to Maryland, looking up at her, you know, Tony's got a better looking ass than you. What was her response to that? She opened the blouse, said he doesn't have tits like these. <laughs> Do you love it? Back when they both got to Hollywood, Marilyn Monroe was one of Curtis's many girlfriends. He has been married five times, first to Janet Lee, mother of actress Jamie Lee Curtis, the only one of his six children to enter showbiz. He admits that he has not been the most attentive dad, but denies that he and Jamie Lee are estranged. She's a charming, lovely girl. We have wonderful conversation where we're together, but I know what she's doing, and she knows what I'm doing. We are both in our separate worlds. Now Curtis is married to 32-year-old Jill Vandenberg Curtis. 
What about that? Um, I mean, he's older than your mom. I know, yeah. I know. We, we never really thought about it. I don't know. If you know Tony, then there's, the age is not even an issue. This is number five. Yes. <laughs> is this one gonna last? Well, I'll, so I'll, far. I'll, yeah, yes. so far, so good. <laughs> yeah. I'll last as long as she will, and she's gonna last a long time. This uh, easel belonged to Edward G. Robinson. In fact, Curtis goes nonstop. And if he seems to affect the Pablo Picasso look, well, that may be because Curtis is an artist too. The elegant house where he and Jill live, overlooking the city of Las Vegas, is filled with his paintings. I used to paint in my garage, and I'd have a little room in the house to the back, but when we decided to move here, we included building a studio. And this is my studio. This is it, huh? He credits his art with helping him through a period of addiction to liquor and cocaine in the 1970s. He has also made hundreds of small collages set into boxes in the manner of artist Joseph Cornell. But as much as Tony Curtis loves the hour spent working on his art, nothing has given him as much pleasure as show business. More than a hundred films and now some like it hot the musical, touring cities all across the country. How do you feel when you come out at the end of the show and people are going crazy? It's so moving for me. And you know, I've become perhaps a household word in a way. You know, I've become part of everybody's memory. So many sure. people have grew, grown up with me, so I'm part of the furniture. I started out a kitchen chair, and now I'm a sofa. <laughs> Henry Fonda was a migrant worker in the Grapes of Wrath, a good guy. Henry Fonda was a young naval officer in Mr. Roberts, a good guy. And in those and many other plays and movies, not just a good guy, but a splendid actor. Oddly, Henry Fonda has never won an Academy Award. He's been nominated this year for his role in On Golden Pond. Haywood Hill Brune profiles the patriarch. Ain't you going back, Abe? No, I think I might go on a piece. Maybe to the top of that hill. Fonda is somehow the guardian of a, of a certain kind of sense of truth and a certain kind of nobility that exists in him. After all, uh, you know, he, he, he is America. You know, he's played Lincoln, Tom Joad in Grapes of Wrath. I mean, the his, the, the, his, his list of films is magnificent. Like Casey says, Fella ain't got a soul of his own, just a little piece of a big soul. The one big soul that belongs to everybody. Then... Then what, Doc? Then it don't matter. I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and they know supper's ready. And when the people are eating the stuff they raise and living in the houses they build, I'll be there too. One of his directors says, He's been president a half a dozen times and secretary of state, and he has a kind of nobility of spirit where he's, he has in him a, a sense of size and greatness where not only is uh, he capable of playing with a great sense of truth, but he's also capable of playing great men. But I never thought I'd live to see the day the United States government would call out armed troops against its own unarmed citizens on the streets of Chicago. Look at them. 
3,600 of them. Guns drawn, bayonets fixed, lined up against the strikers. Look at them. Do you know what day this is? It's the 4th of July, Independence Day. His daughter says. I think he, he becomes liberated when he can uh, hide behind another person. He's too shy. He's too uncertain of actually who he is. He, uh, he's tremendously lacking in self-confidence, sense of his own identity. But when someone gives him a character that he can fill out, he's filling out the character. It's true if you study his, his long history of of acting. He's not the same person. It's not a personality actor. Peter Fonda naturally has a unique view of Henry. He hooks all of us, and he sure didn't let us down. All of us who look at him for that special quality that makes him America's American. Everybody around the world. And I travel around the world, and there's no way I can get away from being Henry Fonda's son, so I hear about it gladly. It doesn't bore me. I know he's my father, and I'm proud of him, too. But I get especially proud when I hear people from a culture totally different than ours that doesn't understand democracy as we hopefully practice it, who think of him as the essence of democracy, the essence of the fair and just person, the essence of the man who will come and take care of business, and yet the man who is not untouchable, the man who is not from the castle, but has access to the castle the man who comes from the ground, from the soil. He's got it covered. Whatever he is, Henry Fonda is the only American actor as deeply and successfully rooted in stage as he is in film. He is the man who filled this Broadway theater for more than two years as Mr. Roberts and is now filling movie theaters in On Golden Pond. He began as American heroes should, a clean-cut, small-town boy with enough grit to try anything. It never occurred to me that I'd ever be an actor. I was a much too self-conscious young man. And when I got pushed on the stage at the, the Little Theater uh, 20, 55 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing. I was self-conscious. Uh, but gradually, during the three years that I became more active, and Greg Foley cast me as Merton of the Movies and another several of the good parts, and eventually I went to New York, I got to, I don't know where I got it, but it was just a feeling that I don't want the audience to see the wheels work. Mm -hmm. Disguise whatever technique you put into your work and make it so real that they believe it. Jimmy Stewart is among the oldest of his friends. If you get the audience believing that what they're seeing up there is actually happening, you see, see him on the screen, it, it's, it, he, he convinces you. It's complete believability. This is, uh, and, and to be able to grow right into it, from one age group to another age group, and, and to be able to do it and add stature to himself as an actor at the same time, this is, this is, is unique. This is, uh, this is a, a wonderful thing to see. Happy birthday, dear Norman. Happy birthday to you. Right now, he's everyone's lovable gramps in On Golden Pond, for which he has, as best actor, one of the film's 10 Oscar nominations. It was his first appearance with co-star Katherine Hepburn, his first screen appearance with his daughter Jane, and should he win, his first victory in Oscar voting. I'm surprised I got here so fast. <laughs> but I'm glad I got spent so much time with this beautiful woman. What's her name again? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for coming all the way here from Disneyland to witness this historic event. Here, in a moment of weakness, old age has made him vulnerable. I got the end of our lane. I couldn't remember where the old town road was. One little way in the woods, there was nothing familiar, not one damn tree. It scared me half to death. That's why I came running back here to you, see your 
pretty face. I could feel safe. I was still me. Jane bought the screen rights as a present for her father. Well, the director says that I wanted to do this to, to sort of um, resolve, unresolve things with my father. That's, that's not why I wanted to do it. I didn't even think of that at the time. But as we began to rehearse and as, as we got into the filming, these things started coming up like bones from the bottom of the La Brea tar pits. They just started surfacing... Uh, Tremendous wells of love and um, anger and awe and things that I wanted to say uh, that hadn't been said. And uh, as, as these things got played out, I would literally, he'd say, the director would say, cut, and I'd look around the room and I would see on the faces of the crew and the people around that they were very affected. And I thought, oh, this isn't just me and him. This is, this is lots of people. Not just fathers and daughters, sons and fathers and mothers and sons. To some extent, he's still a stranger. I go over and see him, which I will as soon as this interview is over. And I, as usual, will sit and watch him and look at him and, and wonder who he is. I mean, parts of him I understand very, very well because I'm very much like him. But in his book, in the biography that came out, I, I read it and study it. and. Uh, it's helped me a little bit, little pieces of information that children aren't usually told. Love affairs that went wrong, broken hearts, fear of kissing, all those funny things. But um, I don't entirely understand why he's so shy, why he uh, feels that he has nothing to, to say, nothing to teach, because he does. We've been there a thousand times, darling. Golden Pond's Norman Thayer Jr. is not quite as saintly as the typical Fonda role, which may be something of a relief to him. Listen to me, mister. You're my knight in shining armor. I wish I was that man. I would like to be. I'm not the opposite, of course, but I'm just not as good as any of those men were. I was not as good a man as Mr. Roberts was, as nice a man, but... Uh, I wish I was. Crotchety he may be, but cruelty is forbidden, as a single foray into villainy proved. His biographer, Howard Teichman, recalls the film, a spaghetti western in which Fonda wore a black hat. I see it uh, about once every three months on late night television. And when they approach the point where he's about to shoot the little boy, uh, a bell sounds. Henry starts to draw his gun, and they cut to a commercial. American television will not allow its audience to see Henry Fonda kill a nine-year-old boy. Like good American heroes, Fonda had a long climb up the ladder, as he told us on Broadway a few years ago. I had no ambition to be big. It never occurred to me that I would be a, a big success. That stardom didn't occur to me. But this, this thing about acting that I just recently discovered it was fun, it was make-believe, it was pretend. And you could make a living at it, and that's all I expected, was just to make a living. And eventually I began to realize that uh, it was therapy for me, because I was not self-conscious on the stage, because I had a mask on. And then I hear you got paid for it in New York, and I came to New York. That's how naive I was. Just came to New York, I didn't have any money. I came to New York, because that's where you got paid for this hat time. Sixty years ago here in Omaha, Lifesavers candy was something brand new. Grandpa Fonda was hooked on him. As he roams the wide world of the successful actor, Fonda carries Omaha in his heart, his head, and his voice. Flavors are like coming home again to Omaha. Aren't you Jane Fonda's father? Justin can't wait to be an actor. It is from Omaha, with a grandson at his side, that he launches the frail but determined dream of a Fonda dynasty. And I thought it might be appropriate that Justin take his first bow on the Omaha Community Playhouse.
You want to tell us why I didn't pick up your grandmother dialysis today? At one point in its production, the working title for this movie was A Few Good Years, but its star, Kirk Douglas, has had a lot more than a few good years. He's 86 now, a little hard to understand, and this is his 85th movie. When I was his age, I have supported him all. Wait, that, what are you talking about when you were here? It's the second movie he's made since a stroke left him temporarily speechless. As long as we Throughout his career, Kirk Douglas has delivered some of the most memorable lines in motion picture history. I do know that we're brothers, and I know that we're free. In addition to Spartacus, his credits include Paths of Glory, Lust for Light, and Seven Days in May. I'm suggesting, Mr. President, there's a military plot to take over the government. When this film is released in April, it will probably be called It Runs in the Family, and for good reason. It co-stars Kirk Douglas's son, Michael, his grandson, Cameron, and his ex-wife, Diana Dill. In addition to co-starring in the film, Michael Douglas is also producing it which means Kirk Douglas, the legendary Hollywood tough guy, is now working for his kid. We're having the best time uh, in, in our lives. It's just a, kind of a magical feeling. The camera comes on, and he just he fills up. He fills up, and he comes to life. I play a guy who had a stroke. So I could play the guy who had the stroke better than you could play that, you see? So it's a challenge. Despite the difficulty he has with his speech, it's easy for Kirk Douglas to talk, even joke about his stroke. But it wasn't always that way. I have always been an actor. An actor talks. Suddenly I had a stroke. I can't talk. What is an actor who can't talk? He must wait for silent pictures to come back or something. Douglas has had more than one brush with death. In 1991, he almost died in a helicopter crash. But this time, fresh out of the hospital and unable to speak, Douglas thought his career had ended. And since his career was his life, he started thinking about ending it all. You wrote about the suicide attempt, so I hope you don't mind if I ask you about it. I embarrassed to talk about my suicide attempt because suicide is selfish and stupid. I, I did have that one moment when I was close to shooting myself in the mouth. Were you serious? I mean, were you really going to do that? I thought so. And what happened? It hit my teeth. Oh. And then I started to laugh because a toothache stopped me from <laughs> committing suicide. Let me be sure I understand this. You put the gun in your mouth. Yes. I can't believe we're talking about a suicide attempt like this, but you're laughing. And it hit your teeth? Exactly. When I had the gum and it hit my tooth. And and, and I said, said, ow. You said, ow. And, and <laughs> I'm saying, ow, I, I was trying to kill myself. And it struck me funny. I had taken the sleeping pills out of his reach. And I had not uh, thought about the guns. I really didn't. Ann Douglas, for about 50 thing. years, Mrs. Kirk Douglas, nearly lost her husband twice in just a few weeks. It never occurred to me that he would t attempt that. But I guess when you're that desperate, and he had to be that desperate, I think anything would have gone. She took over her husband's rehabilitation. She was caring, but she was not coddling. I'm lucky to have a few wives who helped me. Hey, Kirk, get your ass out of the bed and work with you with your speech therapist. She said that to you? Sure. 
She said, get Good. your ass out of bed and work with your speech yeah, therapist? Yeah, he pushed me. She, she was very how to handle me. I raised my voice. And when he says to me, get me a, a glass of water, now that was right next to his night table. I said, get yourself a glass of water. That must have been a little hard for you because it, your first instinct would have been to help him. It huh? definitely was hard on me. And uh, when I went out of the room, I cried a lot of times because it's not in my making. I wanted to help him, but I knew I had to help him that way. Douglas quickly got back on his feet. Getting back his voice was much more difficult. He wasn't totally silent. He could say something, but it wasn't really very clear. He had to work on it hard. Not the speech didn't come back like in a normal way. He had to start from scratch, actually. He was facing a deadline. Kirk Douglas, not surprisingly, had been awarded an Oscar for Lifetime Achievement. It was an honor and a problem. Accepting the award meant giving a speech just six weeks after his stroke. You would have to have to have set up on a stage with, with 2,000 people in the audience and a million people on television. That frightened me. It frightened him even after everything he'd been through in his life. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! Douglas is most proud of Spartacus. Not because of how well he acted, but because of who he hired. Douglas was also the producer of the film. It was during the McCarthy era, and Douglas risked his career by hiring Dalton Trumbo, one of Hollywood's best screenwriters. The trouble was, Trumbo had been blacklisted, denounced as a communist by congressional investigators. Jack Valenti is president of the Motion Picture Association. Anyone who defied the Hollywood establishment was likely to commit career suicide. Despite the blacklist, Trumbo had written a few scripts under assumed names. He never expected to get credit for Spartacus. Finally, Kirk said, wait a minute. Trumbo wrote this script. It's an outrage to put somebody else's name on there. He says, by God, Trumbo wrote this script. His name goes on the picture. I think that's the, the thing that I'm most proud of in my Hollywood career. Because I think it's, it approached being historical. It is part of the history of Hollywood, and one of the reasons he got that Academy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1996. Douglas was able to make his speech that night, and it surprised everyone. We were rehearsing together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Douglases would have been happy if he had gotten thank you out and nothing more. All of a sudden, there comes a speech that none of us had heard. You know, I see my four sons and my wife, who had rehearsed that with him. And he was ad-libbing. He was ad-libbing for about two and a half minutes, and all of a sudden, something clicked. And he then decided, I must do it. Not only I can do it, he proved he could do it, but he, he said to himself, I must do it. Hello. Nice meeting you. <laughs> Kirk Douglas has been looking back on his life lately, rediscovering his Jewish heritage and playing a new role as a philanthropist. With his wife, Anne, he has funded 205 playgrounds in California Go, and four in Israel. He's become good, good, good. an icon, an institution. He's become an extraordinary, valuable member of the community. In addition to the playgrounds, he helped build a theater in Jerusalem. I think that this theater... I think he's been so inspirational for people way past the retirement age of how you can continue to keep growing as a person. 
So here's a man who truly has done it all. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Spartacus. Last June, in a star-studded ceremony, Valenti presided over one more tribute for Douglas in Beverly Hills to honor his humanitarian work. The evening was called A Triumph of the Spirit, and this time Kirk Douglas found his voice with little trouble. I thought I was dead. <laughs> it was a short speech from a man who's come a very long way. Do unto others, and you have them do unto you. But few people practice it. Until we become nicer people, there will be no peace in this world. Thank you very much. Ms. Streep, Streep now. We've seen her in many guises. We believed her in every single one of them. Meryl Streep is that rare sort of performer who seems actually to become another human being before your very eyes. Here's a treat, though. With Harry Smith, come watch Meryl Streep turn before your very eyes into Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, what I would consider the greatest female actor of her generation. The Telluride Film Festival paid tribute this month to a woman whose peak performances are as glorious as the Rocky Mountains. To acknowledge Meryl Streep as a great actress is no stretch. Oh, I'm so happy! <laughs> but that was true even before she started acting in pictures. She was a sensation at Yale Drama School, came to New York, and won acclaim from Off-Broadway to Central Park and Shakespeare with Joe Papp. We interviewed her in a little theater downtown. One of the reasons we did this here, yeah. in a theater, is because I haven't been in a play in 17 years. <laughs> and have you thought about it? Oh, yeah. I think about it all the time. Do you pine for it? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I really, really miss it. I do. It's a thing that I had to. It's a sacrifice that I made for my children that they have no appreciation of. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, so? Plays are stupid. I mean, no, they don't say that, but they just, you know, they don't understand the um, the attachment that I that I had to doing oh, that. This is the steering committee lunch where we plan the Christmas trees. It's very important. I'm going to make chicken pie art, zucchini soup, and my heavenly. It's a mom she plays in her new movie One True Even Thing, a mother dedicated to serving a husband and family. Based on the novel by Anna Quinlan. One True Thing rang true for Meryl Streep. I've always wanted to do a movie about a mother that was uh, honest about what they, do, that what they do to make the world wonderful. I'm home for a while. I took some time off from work. Home where? Here? What about your job and your little apartment? Well, I'm going to work from here. So. Street knows it's a wonderful it. really role oh, and no, no, oh no, so no. rare. Not to play nursemaid to me. Oh, mm -hmm. no, but, that's not. Oh, I don't need you. Yeah, you'll hate me. I'll just make you some dinner. No, I want to stay. Older women are terrifying to everybody in the culture. So um, uh, they're terrifying to women and they're terrifying to men. <laughs> and they're of no interest whatsoever to uh, young men and, uh, you know, teenagers. And, and so it's, it's, it's difficult to find that niche which tells a, a true story about a fully dimensional woman and at the same time is um, <clears throat> screen worthy and, and going to bring people in to the theater. Every time I see you on screen, but whatever role it is you choose, the second I see you in it, you own it. 
your voice is different, you physically may be different. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Oh, well, that's acting. <laughs> I mean, it is. That's what I like to do. That's total immersion into possibility. What a life I could imagine I lived. And uh, that's uh, infinitely interesting you know, to me. And you can't, there's no bottom to it. I read a lot of scripts. And my heart starts to race at some point when I have a, a when I read a character that I want to do. And so that's the, the recognition of a like soul or something in there that I want to say. I'm so inscrutable to myself, I don't really know you know, I've never been in analysis, and I don't understand very much about why I do what I do. This is why, you know, I've, I've been very shy to um, give an acting class or anything, because I do it. <laughs> and uh, I'm yeah, always... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I don't know how to construct it in a logical method that I could impart to someone. I think a class given by me would be something like, well, you know, you just kind of like feel it and, um, you know, just trust yourself and all the stupid platitudes that, you know, don't, don't help. A lot of it is just great deep belief. It's just like religious faith in what you're doing and you just believe in the character. Will you be going to the Harvest Dance this year, Miss Monday? I hardly think so at my age, Sophia. Oh, but she should. It'll be and so with faith in herself and belief in her character, Meryl Streep also appears this fall in Dancing at Lunasa. How is your wife? I no longer have a wife, Miss Monday. Oh, I hadn't heard she passed away. She's gone away to England. While filming Dancing at Lunasa, Meryl Streep, for the first time in her career, had doubts. She struggled with her accent and began to wonder, as they say in baseball, if she was losing her stroke. I had a real guy who was sitting there with the earphones on the set going... <laughs> and I completely lost it. I, I had no idea, and I was really... I come home and cry. Nobody was with me. You know, I was... Everybody was home, and they didn't understand, you know, my husband said, well, what do you mean you can't do the accent? <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Yes, even the consummate actress knows some frustration. But what truly irks Streep is the literal and proverbial back seat Hollywood often tries to shove women into. Um, I, our job now, ladies, is to put our heads down and to hold our hands out and work like mad for all of our girls to put their stories and their dreams on the screen where they're important. And, and if film reflects the, the culture, how about this? Time Magazine's recent special issue on the 100 artists and entertainers of the century. Film critic Richard Schickel praises Brando, Olivier, Cagney, and Pacino, but not one woman. You know, you just, your, your heart curdles if it's um, what you do. I would like to have had one lady mentioned, you know? Catherine Hepburn. Did she live? Did she exist? <laughs> Did she act? <laughs> Betty Davis, maybe? Maybe somebody? Vanessa, maybe? Or for I that matter, Meryl Streep. Her know, portrayals, it's too, it's very... leave an indelible imprint. Mm, thank you for your mm, concern. Is what you do an art? Is it a craft? Is it a job? You mean, is it highfalutin or midfalutin or <laughs> a paycheck? Yeah, I don't know. There, when other people do it, sometimes when I watch other people do it really well, I think it's beyond an art, you know, it's like mu making music. But at its best. <clears throat> 
for you. At its best, it's like flying, you know, it's great. It's great. And that's the part I wouldn't give up, and that's the part I won't give up, even though I love my children and being home and doing what they need me to do. I certainly also need to express myself in this way.